Um, for the first talk this morning, we are going to have Dr. Bullock talking a little bit about central cord and uh, timing of surgery. So without further ado, Landon, why don't you uh, take over the screen and we will uh, look forward to hearing your talk this morning. All right, thank you, Dr. Pat, for that introduction. Um, for those of you who haven't met yet, my name is Landon Bullock. I'm one of the PGY2s. We're gonna be talking about central cord this morning. Um, I have no disclosures related to this talk. Um, this is a brief outline and I'm gonna start with two of cases. So our first patient here is a 62 year old male. He has a history of alcohol abuse. He presents status post ground level fall while intoxicated. His chief complaints included upper extremity sensory deficits and back pain. On physical exam, he had decreased strength in his C5 through 7 distributions bilaterally and full strength in his lower extremities. His patient's chief complaint was burning hands bilaterally. Um, he was also reporting some nonspecific numbness and tingling of his lower extremities along with urinary retention. This is the T2 weighted sagittal cut of his cervical MRI. Note the cord edema seen at C4-5 along with C5-6. There was also mild cervical canal stenosis from C4 to 7, along with some diffuse degenerative changes noted. Um, it is important to also detect, we did not detect any acute fractures or dislocations, along with no acute disc herniations. Now on to our second case, um, briefly introduce this one to you. Um, this is a 40-year-old male. He was intoxicated and was struck by oncoming traffic while he was riding his bicycle. Um, he presented to the emergency department with tetraparesis, um, GCS of 3T upon arrival. He was reported to us to be an Asia A complete spinal cord injury by the trauma team. Um, however, when we evaluated him, um, he was thought to have sacral sparing. So this was important in differentiating the complete versus incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, also interesting, um, there were noted findings of anterior syndesmophyte formation and facet joint fusion below his fracture site on CT. So this would be consistent with an ankylosing spondylitis diagnosis. Um, the anterior vertebral body tethering and overall increased rigidity associated with ankylosing spondylitis makes these patients more susceptible to unstable fracture dislocation injuries. Um, MRI imaging revealed a C6-7 extension type fracture dislocation with T2 hyperintensity seen in the cord from C5 to C7. There was also significant widening of his anterior posterior elements with cord compression visualized from C5 to C7. So both of these patients I've mentioned have varying degrees of incomplete spinal cord injuries, and this is going to lead us into our topic today. So what is central cord? Um, it is defined as an injury to the cervical and or thoracic spinal cord that causes arm greater than leg weakness, variations of sensory impairment, and bladder dysfunction. It is classified as an incomplete spinal cord injury and it follows the Asia impairment scale. I'm gonna to briefly touch on the anatomy of the spinal cord and why it matters. So the damage in this condition can be seen primarily in the white matter of the lateral corticospinal tract. This is your main volunteering motor tract and the upper extremity pathways are more centrally located than that of your lower extremities. So this is why these patients with central cord often present with predominantly upper extremity symptoms. On a neuronal level, what we see is tra trauma to the spinal cord that causes edema within the cord itself, but there's no axonal loss at the level of injury. Um, we do see Wallerian degeneration of the axons adjacent to the epicenter of the injury. So the incidence of um, central cord syndrome, it is the most common incomplete spinal cord injury. It represents 9% of all adult spinal cord injuries and 6.6 .6 for that of pediatric. A mechanism of injury is important here in two distinct patient populations. So the less than 50 year old patient or for this talk, the younger patients, these are more high energy mechanisms. So high speed NVCs, um, athletic injuries, gunshots, assaults, et cetera. And then um, a greater than 50 year old population or for this talk, the elderly population um, is gonna be more associated with low energy events. So this is lower speed NVCs and then most commonly ground level falls. So high energy trauma in these younger patients leads to acute fracture dislocations and then acute disc herniations. Um, and they experience more of a flexion compression mechanism, which is in contrast to our older patient population um, that often have underlying cervical degenerative disease. And then they undergo a subsequent hyperextension mechanism. And this leads to buckling of the ligamentum flava. Um, the diagnosis of central cord is primarily clinical. However, the imaging is really important to support your diagnosis. 
um, primary diagnosis criteria was proposed by Schneider et al. in 1954, stating that it had to include these three things, disproportionate upper extremity motor deficits compared to that of the lower, bladder dysfunction, and a varying degree of sensory loss below the level of the lesion, and grading of injury severity in central cord is determined using the above Asia scale. All patients um, with central cord or concerns for central cord need plain films and or CT to rule out acute fracture dislocations. However, the gold standard and best modality for evaluating the spinal cord itself is the MRI of the cervical spine without contrast. The most consistent MRI finding is hyperintense signal within the cord on T2-weighted imaging. In general, the natural course of this condition is favorable. Bosch et al. reviewed 60 patients with acute central cord syndrome at the two-year mark, and he found that 75% had documented improvement However, a functional ambulatory level was only seen in about 59% of these patients. Whereas Aoda and colleagues in 2006 studied 87 patients over a two year period, and they noted that 86% of these patients recovered the ability to ambulate and 80% recovered a functional independence level. However, 47% had a persistent neuropathic pain and 68% had residual bladder dysfunction. So several prognostic factors have been identified throughout the literature. A study by Roth et al. in 1990 showed that factors associated with a good prognosis included younger age, pre-injury employment, the absence of lower extremity weakness on initial presentation, and documented improvement of strength during the initial rehabilitation period. This table here summarizes the change of mindset regarding the treatment of acute central cord over time. Um, it ranges from strictly conservative seen early in the 1950s and that now it is increased to a more surgical consideration for the appropriate patient population. Here are some general guidelines that were released in 2013 regarding the treatment of central cord. However, it is important to note that these are guidelines and they are not treatment standards. Um, and I'll unpack these a little further as we continue. So first goal with maintaining maps of this patient um, patients need prompt ICU admission and they'll need an R1 placed with, for monitoring. Um, and the goal is volume resuscitation followed by vasopressors if needed. And this is shown to improve neurological outcomes and prevent secondary injury to the cord. Um, next is the ongoing debate whether there is a role for steroid administration in the setting of acute spinal cord injury. And I will expound on this a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and lastly, uh, patients must be immobilized in a hard cervical collar and this is recommended for at least six weeks. So um, the corticosteroid administration in the setting of acute spinal cord injury has been a widely debated topic since the early 1990s. The NASA's trials were pivotal at that time supporting the use of high-dose IV methylprednisolone administration. I do need to point out that the NASA's trials included complete and incomplete spinal cord injuries, and they did not differentiate the results between these two. Multiple other studies have gone on to criticize the NASA's trials and ultimately concluded that the data was not reported correctly and did not show improvement in vital patient outcomes. And further, um, these studies additionally emphasized associations found between high dose methylprednisolone and side effects such as pneumonia, GI bleeding, and death. When polling our CNSA and OC faculty regarding the administration of steroids in the setting of acute central cord, Overwhelmingly, their response was that they no longer support the use of high-dose methylprednisolone in any setting. Um, those who would consider steroid use at all, they would consider it in the younger patient and only if the injury was diagnosed in the first eight hours, and also at a much lower dosing than outlined here. So even more controversial is that of timing of surgery. Uh, multiple studies have attempted to answer the question, as you can see above. Um, Thaling et al. surveyed 971 spine surgeons across the country regarding the timing of surgical decompression in the acute traumatic central cord syndrome patient. He found that 13% of surgeons stated that they would decompress within a 24-hour mark, 16% would operate at six weeks, and the rest opted for conservative management alone. And also of note, orthopedically trained spine surgeons were more likely to operate than their neurosurgery counterparts when asked. The STASIS trial in 2012 was conducted by Failing and Vicaro. This was a large multi-center prospective study designed to determine whether the timing of surgery influenced functional recovery from acute traumatic cervical cord injury. Significant neurological recovery here is defined as two Asia-grade improvements at the six-month mark. 
Um, however, a major limitation that was acknowledged by the study is that the early decompression group included those patients with more severe injuries, along with more, excuse, more young patients. It makes sense that these surgeons were more aggressive in the surgical decompression of younger, also more severely injured patients. It is important to discuss that the decision of surgery should be based on a patient's overall clinical status. So this includes their initial presentation and their injury severity, but also just as importantly, their continued clinical course. These patients should be readily reassessed as frequently as every four to six hours for monitoring of their neurological status. Also next, um, important before I, I divulge this, it's important I clarify that the um, ref I'm referring here to not biomechanical stability, but a patient's clinical stability. So stable injuries for patients with improving clinical function, they can be considered for a more delayed surgical intervention versus conservative management alone, whereas unstable spinal injuries, so ongoing compressive lesions and severe deficits that are not improving or declining, these should be considered for more urgical surgical intervention. Um, so now that we've decided to operate, what procedures indicated? Um, patients with more acute fracture dislocation injuries that have disruption of their posterior and or anterior elements, they should be considered for a fusion procedure to achieve stabilization, um, whereas an argument can be made for an isolated decompression in more biomechanically stable compressive lesions. Lastly, anterior versus posterior approaches. Uh, generally, the data would suggest that if a focal anterior compressive lesion can be identified, then an anterior approach is recommended. However, if your patient has a diffuse stenotic cervical canal, then a more extensive posterior approach should be considered. So going back to our patients, um, what would you do for this guy? Um, I'll tell you, we managed this patient conservatively in a hard collar. He was promptly admitted to the ICU. Um, he had significant improvement throughout his stay. He remained ambulatory throughout. Um, he did have return of his bladder function. Um, his chief complaint upon discharge was still this burning hands phenomena. Um, and of note, this patient did receive IV steroids for the first 24 hours of his admission. He received uh, 10 milligrams of Decadron um, upon his initial admission, and then six milligrams IV Q6, excuse me, Q12 um, for the remainder of the 24 hours. And ultimately the plan discussed with him was a laminoplasty on an outpatient basis when he was ready. And to our um, second patient, so drastically different, um, this patient underwent urgent surgical stabilization along with C5 through 7 decompression and extended instrument infusion from C4 to T2. Um, his patient, for this patient's neurological status improved significantly. He was able to be discharged to rehab two weeks after the surgery. Um, he did still have a Foley catheter at the time of his discharge, but he was ambulatory and he had only complaints of upper extremity weakness. His two-year follow-up was significantly improved. Um, he only had residual left upper extremity deficits and full resolution of all lower extremity and bowel and bladder issues. So to bring this all home, I think we can all agree on a few conclusions. First, these younger patients with acute traumatic compression type injuries would most benefit from early surgical decompression. Um, early is defined as within 24 hours in some studies where it is 48 hours in others but we can at least agree on um, 48 hours at minimum. Next, there is no data to support early surgical intervention on these more chronic stable patients. Also, despite seeing clinical use of steroids, we can agree that the high dose methylprednisolone is no longer indicated in any setting. Some debate can still be seen regarding lower dosages, but the literature does not provide a clear answer for this. Lastly, um, keep in mind that overall clinical course is key. So how a patient progresses is just as important as they initially presented. But overall, there's a definite need for further research into the timing of surgical intervention for acute central cord, and even further then into which procedures should we be performing. Um, so thank you for um, all the help that I got from the OC and the CNSA teams, along with Dr. Pat. Um, and always thank you for the Jimbo's for their love and support. Um, and I'd like to open it now for questions and comments. Great, thanks, Landon. That was excellent. Um, you know, it's a it's a great topic to to discuss, and I'll be interested in uh, others' feedback. It's um, it, it remains a very controversial topic, uh, both the the timing side, and you know, I'd be interested when people are discussing the timing. Also, just a, a comment from some of our other spine colleagues on. 
uh, steroids. Um, so I would 100% agree. I don't use the methylprednisolone um, protocol at all anymore. Um, but in incomplete injuries, I definitely um, give them a little bit of uh, dexamethasone uh, on admission and sometimes till surgery and through surgery. So um, see lots of uh, spine surgeons on, so I'll defer to uh, others for comments. Hey, Josh, this is uh, Corey. How are you? Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Great job, Landon. Uh, nice overview of uh, a controversial area. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, no, you know, number one, uh, as Landon pointed out, there really is no evidence basis for a lot of what is done. Uh, you know, steroids have, have been debunked. I know that you use steroids. I'd use them too. And, you know, as long as there's not an obvious contraindication, like somebody with brittle diabetes or um, or other underlying issues um, at, at lower doses than the met met methylprednisolone. Um, the reason for it in my mind is actually for the pain. Uh, you know, the burning hands is, is a common presentation. And so a, a combination of gabapentin and uh, decadron seems to help with the pain. I don't, I don't feel like I'm helping the spinal cord injury by doing that. I feel like I'm potentially helping them symptomatically. The other thing is, is that it, it kind of a legacy with central cords, everyone has a tendency, even when they don't have fractures, to throw them in a collar. And there really is a sum total of zero evidence basis for the use of collars in, um, in uh, central cord syndrome. And if you think about it intuitively, it makes no sense. They're not unstable. Uh, they basically pinch their cord and because they have stenosis, the stenosis is still there and they, and they pinch their cord secondary to a hyperflexion injury or some sort of mechanical injury like that. And so th they're not unstable. So there really isn't much use in putting them in a collar. So that's just a couple of comments, but, you know, there certainly is an area that is, is controversial. And, and like Landon pointed out, the timing is, 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 remains controversial as well. I think that, you know, most of us would say if somebody is plateaued, then it becomes uh, reasonable to consider doing uh, surgical intervention. A bunch of these folks, like were pointed out in the case studies, are people who are not necessarily the most reliable folks. And so a lot of times if, if you get to them before they go to rehab or after they get out of rehab, they're more likely to be, not be lost to follow up. So that takes a, plays a role as well. Hey, Landon, this is Eric Laxer. Uh, first of all, that was great. I think you gave an excellent and succinct overview. And like so many problems we treat is not without its, its amount of controversy. Um, I don't use steroids either at this point, but what's interesting is when the high dose steroid papers came out, uh, I've mentioned this to people before, it was almost like malpractice if you didn't put patients on these high dose steroids. And you know there were certainly many of us who were questioning, is this really making a difference or not? Uh, one thing to emphasize, which you talked about is medically manage these patients as soon as they get to the hospital, because one thing that we think can be helpful is keeping their mean arterial pressures, as you said, above 85. And I think that's easily overlooked when they get admitted, especially in the middle of the night, and they don't necessarily go to a monitored bed. Um, so from a resident's perspective, if you're on call and one of these patients comes in, that's a very important thing to address. Great, thanks, Eric. 